Hi there, welcome to an AS Micro topic revision video uh, looking at market failure and in this case the concept of demerit goods. So what are demerit goods? Well they're goods that uh, are perceived to deliver a lower benefit to the consumer than he or she realises at the time of consumption. So uh, demerit goods are thought to be bad for you Consumption can also uh, confer a negative externality onto third parties. Um, for example, passive smoking, increased healthcare costs for societies and things. Uh, and we assume that uh, utility maximizing rational consumers often ignore the externalities they might impose on other people. So with demerit goods, the social cost of consumption can be higher than the private cost because the act of consumption can lead to some external costs. And you could you could show an externalities diagram to, to analyze that. I think the key thing about demerit goods is the assumption built in most examples that consumers may be suffering from some kind of information gap, some kind of information failure. In other words, uh, consumers may be unaware in part or in the whole of the of the externalities they create, but also about the impact on their own benefits, their own costs. So with demerit goods. Often there's a case for a government intervention, government intervention because there's overconsumption of demerit goods. Uh, perhaps the government introduces a tax, or perhaps it introduces some kind of regulation. Now the issue of tax is important. Uh, we've obviously got in recent times the introduction of the sugar tax going to be phased in in the next two years on on the range of sugary drinks. Many economists argue that taxation is actually relatively ineffective and or inequitable as a way of, for example, of curbing drug use, uh, gambling, uh, excessive uh, consumption of demerit goods. Uh, banning uh, or limiting consumption may reduce demand, but that creates uh, the risk of uh, secondary uh, shadow markets. So demerit goods essentially create negative externalities for the people, but crucially, they have a, they have a consequence for the consumer themselves. What do we count as demerit goods? Well, the key point is right at the bottom of this slide. Arguments about what is a demerit good involve normative economics. We're making a value judgment. Sometimes your perception of what is a demerit good will be coloured, be influenced by your social norms, by your perhaps your religious beliefs, by your cultural background. But in the news at the moment, the economic effects are long-term consequences of high caffeine drinks, particularly students revising for exams and things. The longer term economic consequences of, of uh, increased consumption of high fat, high sugar, high salt foods. What To what extent is the use of uh, consumption of uh, violent films, uh, um, computer games, a demerit good? Uh, is driving hands-free mobile in a, in a car actually a merit good or a demerit good? It's open to debate. The economics of, uh, of alcohol fraud, uh, binge drinking. And tobacco. All of these things are kind of contemporary issues. You'll have your own views and the key is to be able to analyse the issues, analyse the costs and the benefits and then try to evaluate should there be some form of intervention in the market that doesn't have to be uh, and if so uh, what, what might be most effective. Sugar in the debate of course Mexico has introduced a sugar tax ahead of the UK in part I guess because they they realised there was a, a significant issue. The data from Tufts University finds that the death rate from sugar drinks in Mexico was something like two and a half times the highest next country, South Africa, uh, whereas the UK, I think it's not shown, is it? But the death rate is, the perceived death rate is huge in Mexico. And of course, that's one factor behind the sugar tax, which came in. Um, we talked about information failure. This chart is a survey from Ipsos Mori of the difference between people's perception of the extent of obesity in the country and the actual data. Uh, presumably the measurements of obesity are based on standardised uh, body mass index uh, for people aged over 20. And you can see that in most countries, in most countries, Brazil ranging down to Saudi Arabia, the, the average guess of the percentage of the population that's obese is significantly below the actuality. Um, although I think, I think the Americans actually are not too bad. That fifty percent guess is actually sixty-six percent. So there's a there's a hint here that uh, you know obesity is, um, is clearly a major issue. But many many people don't necessarily think the true scale of obesity is as big as it is. Uh, one of the analysis diagrams you can use with demerit goods is the information gap diagram. In this case, um, 
Let's take, for example, the consumption of perhaps cigarettes, for example. Perhaps the consumer of a cigarette overestimates the marginal private benefit derived from smoking. So their free market equipment will be at Q1, but they have limited information. Um, with demerit goods, the actual benefit uh, could be less than that. So um, if the consumer are better informed, then the demand would reflect this. The marginal private benefit with full of information will be to the left resulting in an equilibrium level of consumption of Q2. So in that sense, demerit goods tend to be over-consumed in the free market. That leads, partly because of information failure, that can lead to a misallocation of resources because too many scarce resources are being devoted towards the consumption of demerit goods in a free market situation. Um, again, why do consumers overestimate? We'll leave that to you to think about, but uh, they may be ignorant of the health consequences of smoking. Perhaps they are fully aware of it, um, but oftentimes they're not. I think that's true with lots of consumption decisions. We're not fully aware of the consequences, despite the plethora of information available, including on the web. E-cigarettes, in the news at the moment. E-cigarettes, are they a demerit good or are they a merit good? Or are they neither? Uh, we know that in the UK, this is quite recent data from the ONS, that there's over 2 million e-cigarette users in the UK and uh, of around those approximately 67% of people vape every day about one in five once a week um, and crucially uh, quite a high percentage of um, people vape because they feel e-cigarettes are less harmful than regular cigarettes and about half 53% are using e-cigarettes to help them quit smoking so there's a debate I'm sure you probably had this in your lessons about whether e-cigarettes are a demerit good or a merit good. Well, it's up to you to come to come to a view. Um, now there are private costs and external costs of e-cigarette consumption. The private costs to the consumer are the cost of buying the e-cig packs and the cost of buying liquid nicotine cartridges and replacing them. So there's clearly a cost to the consumer of consumption. There may be some external costs. Uh, I was <laughs> delivering a revision presentation in the cinema a few weeks back and one somewhere in the back of the cinema somebody had started e-vaping in a full cinema and you kind of think well wait a minute is that allowed so perhaps the vapor from e-cigs is dangerous what does the medical uh, evidence suggest we don't know perhaps some people claim that e-cigs are, are a gateway to to young people to smoke uh, regular cigarettes so there could be some externality in terms of external costs uh, we know the benefits to the consumer of e-cigarettes, you take a nicotine hit if you vape, presumably. Um, perhaps there's less social isolation, in the sense that e-cigarettes you know, e allow you to be more socially active and things. And there could also be some social benefits, there could be some external benefits. Perhaps the evidence tilts towards e-cigarettes being a useful, effective um, or substitute good to help smokers quit. And in the long run, if that is the case, if people smoke less, then that might reduce the health cost to society, the NHS burden and taxpayers as a whole will benefit. So there is a debate. There's clearly a debate about the extent of these costs and benefits. How do you value the externalities? How do you measure them? How significant are they? Where does the balance lie? I'll leave that up to you. Uh, the economics is fascinating. So too is the politics, of course. Occasionally, just occasionally, with demerit goods, there could be a case for a complete, a complete ban. It's one of those kind of extreme diagrams. So you might argue that the state should say under no circumstances should this product be available, even you know, in, in the market. This diagram shows the case for a complete ban. If you look at the marginal, so this is, we're assuming here there's a huge negative externality uh, from the product. So the external cost, the vertical distance between the MSC and the MPC curve is huge. Do you notice that there is no level of output where the social marginal cost is less than the social marginal benefit. So in other words, if I just get my mouse over here, there's no output level where marginal social cost is anywhere close to marginal social benefit. So you can make a case for saying that, uh, that's the free market equilibrium there, in fact, there's actually a case for saying, such as the scale of the externality, there's a case for a complete ban on the product. And you think of some examples, I mean, who knows? I mean, things like legal highs, possibly, things like, uh, extremely addictive hard hard drugs possibly again 
even if you ban something, it doesn't stop there. There are unintended consequences. There might be cost of enforcement, cost of monitoring, cost of um, implementing a ban. Secondary markets might emerge, and that could have even bigger longer term effects. But that's the diagram you would use if you want to talk about a complete ban. Interestingly, division is uh, opinion is divided on on the kind of uh, the sugar tax debate. This was a survey that came out from uh, Populous, I think, a few weeks back. On people asked how effective do you think it would be to introduce the following measures. Now, effectiveness. Let me just highlight that word for you. Effectiveness is one of those great evaluation words, which you can put into your exam answers. You know, because you can challenge and question the effectiveness of something oftentimes using the concept of elasticity of demand. So people are asked in this survey, how effective do you think it would be to introduce the following measures? And you can see there's a lot of divided opinion that the, um, the blue bit is very effective. And you can see across the, across the four examples there, targeted interventions with obesity people, tar tax on sugary drinks, ban of supermarket discounts, tax on chocolate, less than one person in six in some cases, you know, less than 10% think it would be very effective. Only a quarter of people, or actually 30%, sorry, 20 people of seven, think that supermarket price promotion bans and taxes on chocolate would be effective or very effective. A lot of consumers are have a have a kind of a, a doubt um, about whether these things are effective. We're going to find out, aren't we? When the sugar tax comes in, we are going to see what the consequences are. We've already seen things like the plastic bag tax come in. Uh, I'm sure if these things are effective, there'll be more taxes on different products. But it, that'll be interesting to see. With demerit goods, we can talk about taxes, we can talk about subsidies, a lot of, a lot of interesting economics now in the area of behavioural science, in the area of shoves and nudges. A nudge is basically an alternative to using a tax and a subsidy. So, for example, banning smoking in public places, which happened, of course, a few years ago, is basically a way of eliminating and taking away a choice. Perhaps one of the most important health policy decisions of, of my generation, the ban of smoking in public places, had a, a remarkable effect on health outcomes in, in many areas. Banning takeaways close to schools, the, the recent law restricting tanning salons to over 18s, that's a kind of classic takeaway of choice. Second behavioural nudge is to, is to introduce some kind of financial penalty, some kind of disincentive to take a particular course of action. So tax on cigarettes, the congestion charge, the new sugar tax is a tax, is a disincentive. You could go the other way and subsidise a good alternative. So subsidising healthy eating, for example, or drivers who stay within the speed limit are entered into a lottery and they get a share of the prize money, which is paid for by the fines of people who speed too much. And then thirdly, with nudge, you've got some other ways just to try and influence the choices people make. So better information, calorie counts on menus, that's open to debate, of course. Better labelling of products. Changes to the environment, so designing buildings with fewer lifts and more stairs. Changes to default options, uh, making salad the default option instead of chips. Uh, and also trying to, change, trying to change social norms, the use of social norms information about what other people are doing so you know telling people that other people are paying their taxes the social norm for example associated with the seatbelt law for many many years people said it'll never work when you bring a seatbelt law in people will not use it well i don't think anybody would ever go back now to a situation where people don't have seatbelts in cars the social norm changed the other example i'll finish with is the social norm of drinking and driving Go back 25 years, 30 years, there was a phrase which said, we had a pub or club after a match that said, used to say, let's have one for the road. One for the road. Should we have another pint before we head home? I mean, the social norm of drink driving has changed and who knows, probably will be tightened in years to come. So social norms can influence choice. It doesn't necessarily have to be the, the hand of government. Here's some behavioural economics in action. So sometimes there's been some trials of using cash incentives for the NHS to stop people smoking. Um, lotteries to encourage uh, weight loss or cut speeding. On the oh, I've shown a picture of a pharmaceutical product there. Who knows? Oh, that's called chunking, by the way. Okay, so give give people to encourage people to um, 
finish their course of treatment, to give them pills in different colours. They're more likely to finish the, the treatment. And also the way in which food is designed in schools and things. If you had your lunch in the school canteen, the architecture of the canteen, the architecture of where the food is placed to encourage healthy eating. And that platter looked pretty healthy to me, except there isn't much sauce there. Okay, so we looked at some of the analysis. We looked at some of the economics of demerit goods, a potential cause of market failure. However, don't forget, with demerit goods, there is always a value judgment in what we're talking about. And that's worth mentioning in every exam question. Thanks a lot.